if you present yourself as a product to be consumed, people are going to treat you that way. But if you present yourself as a human being, you're going to cultivate relationships and your audience is going to respond to you as a human and not just a consumer. And in all honesty, it's like when they hear your music and they like your music and then they go to your profile and all they see is promo photos and things like that. And there's nothing interesting that relates to them. It's like, cool, I like your music. Awesome. I want more of your music. But what else is there here for me? And if there's nothing else there for them, they're going to move on to the next artist and they're, they're going to scroll past you because it's flat and there's nothing they can really connect. They're looking for that and they want to engage with that. And if you can't offer that for them, they're going to move on. You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 203. I'm your co-host, Jack McCarthy. With me is my co-host, Ed Isola. What's up, dude? Not much. Just kicking it. Excited to dive in today and uh, having a pretty good week so far. We've got a really, really special guest with us today for this episode, which is going to be all about creating cool and authentic and awesome content that pulls your fans in, magnetic content that makes them want to go, you know, from maybe just being a casual kind of listener, maybe somebody who checks out your music every once in a while, to someone who actually wants to engage with you. So I'm super, super pumped to welcome to Creative Juice for the first time, officially as an entrepreneur team member, although she's been a big part of our team for quite some time now, Miss Shay Langford, who is an account strategist at IndieX and an indie founder coach as well. So Shay, welcome to Creative Juice. So pumped to have you. Thanks, Jack and Ed. I'm very excited to be here. It's been a minute and I'm glad I'm back. Yeah, for sure. Well, I thought that this would be a great topic to talk with you about because you're kind of like the wizard of world building at IndieX, you know, kind of the person that a lot of us turn to when it comes to strategizing and brainstorming on helping artists really kind of dial in what their content strategy should look like, what kind of stuff they should be talking about beyond just their music. And I think that that's something that a lot of artists struggle with. So I I don't know, I kind of want to kick off there and, and just get your thoughts and ideas. I know you consult with a lot of indies, both in the Indie Founder Coaching Program and work with a lot of our clients at IndieX. And this is something that comes up often. So why do artists struggle with this so much? Letting people in or rather letting out like, the stuff that we care about and kind of being a real engaged human when it comes to the content that we put out there. Yeah, yeah, no, this is great. So there's kind of two things that I think that come to mind right away. And the first thing is, you know, we're still pretty, as far as like artists go and independent musicians, we're still like digital marketing is still pretty like new, so to speak. And like this online world of like, social media and YouTube, even though it's been around for a long time, leveraging that as a musician is just, there's not a very clear path for that. And so the mainstream music industry is still pretty dominant and a pretty dominant voice for artists and what they should and should not do for their careers. And so, you know, the the big label names and things like that are still speaking this narrative that you got to look a certain way. You've got to have a flashy music video. You've got to have this kind of super produced content. And those are the kind of things that people are used to seeing from artists a lot because it has such a big history. You know, it's been around for longer. So I think that's kind of the main thing is like, at least also for me as an indie personally watching artists that I really love, especially growing up like in, you know, the the 2000s era with like pop punk and, and warp tour type culture like the music video was very central to that culture, you know, VH1 and like, you know, watching your favorite bands like premiere on TV with their brand new music video was like a big deal. Right. And so like that is still very fresh and it's still very like forward facing. And so like for me as an indie, I was trying to imitate the artists that I loved that were signed to record labels. And so those are the things that I was seeing. And those are, so those are the things that I thought I had to do in order to be successful as, an, as a musician. And so I think 
a lot of it comes from that world still. So that's the number one thing. And then the second thing is I think the online world is a scary place. <laughs> like, like people tend to not be as respectful. Like they're not as respectful and they can kind of hide behind a keyboard and not have to face the face-to-face consequences of like criticizing someone in the online space or, you know, saying something really mean or wh- whatever. So, you know, that negative attitude or kind of negative spirit to things can kind of hide behind the screen. And so like cyberbullying and and being vulnerable online is very risky, you know, because it really opens you up for that kind of criticism. And it's it's scary because, you know, we all want to be liked. We all want to belong. And, you know, it's one thing to like, you know, be going to public school and getting getting bullied by a few people on the playground. But it's another thing to like have it publicly displayed in an online space. So I think that's really terrifying. It still makes me like nervous whenever I hit go on like a new fan finder campaign. I'm always like, all right, I got to ground myself and like know who I am. And like, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, those are the two things that come to mind right off the bat. It's funny because it's like, you don't want to be made fun of and then you don't want to be made fun of on something you're running ads to. So you're like actively driving people to those comments in a way. Let me not put gasoline on this fire of like (laughs) hate that I'm getting online. Yeah. Yeah. But I think one thing I'm excited to get into with you today as, as we get to it is like how you can try to bypass some of that negativity by being more specific and intentional with who you're targeting and with what content you're putting out. But I've always thought that's something you're you're really great at because for me, I feel like I just kind of blindly pick what our interests are and that works because I have a sense of what our fans like because I've been doing it long enough. But that's not really actionable advice to anybody else to be like, oh, just just pick, you know, like, so I'm excited to kind of hear how you go through that process of sorting stuff out. You want me to dive into that? (laughs) Yeah, have at it. Is that a question? I'm sorry. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. No, you were just like stating that. And so I was like, wait, is that a question or a statement? Or like, okay. I didn't know if Jack wanted to add on to that or if I was getting into it too early. So no, go for it. This is great. Yeah. That's so funny. All right. So wait, I just want to make sure that I know exactly what you're asking before I jump in. So you want to hear like the process yeah, I, I about just... like how to target people kind of thing? Or even just like a high level, how you start your topic wheels, that kind of stuff, I think would be really interesting for people to say, I have my lookalike artist, but like, how do I actually figure out what interests outside, you know, someone like my like yoga or something? Yeah, like ex- exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, I totally understand what you're saying now. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, without like... I don't want to get in too much detail about like the topic wheel creation thing. Cause, cause I know like we're going to do that. And like Jack probably has something specific he wants to ask with that. But if you're looking for a place to start with, you know, obviously you have your similar artists, right. But something I like to do is really kind of focus on like the genre of those similar artists and think about what kind of subculture is attached to that genre and sometimes you'll go to like the social media profiles of some of these artists and if they have a robust content strategy you'll be able to find this stuff but like find the content that isn't music centric necessarily like music may be like in the background you know like in the backdrop of the content but they're not like just posting a photo of like hey we played a show last week and it was a blast you know what i mean but if they have some sort of like radio interview where they're talking to somebody about something more cultural like mental health or fashion or something like that or if they were interviewed on a podcast where they're talking more about you know their life uh, outside of just music and kind of finding those pieces of content that speak to a broader narrative and it'll give you clues as to kind of like what culture kind of is connected to that genre or to that artist and if you just follow that trail you can start to figure out what are these topics and these kind of key cultural like crossroads with this particular sound or this particular artist. So I like to kind of start there by just using my brain, you know, and being like, what do I know about this genre? And what do I already know about the people who like this music? And then going to like looking for that content that signals other conversations and starting there. 
you know, figuring out if that makes sense for you and planting those seeds first before you kind of like get too deep. I think that's such a great starting point when it comes to rather than trying to say like, oh, I want to build a culture around my music, which is something that every artist I think Mm -hmm. wants to do or should want to do. But also like looking at it this way, zooming out and being like, how can I impact the culture that I'm already a part of through like, you know, the the style of music that I'm in, you know, the the artists that are adjacent to me, that kind of thing. I think that's such a great approach because it's like, how can I contribute to the conversation as opposed to like, how can I just make something up from scratch here? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, that's such a good point, Jack, because it's like, there are a variety of different reasons why, you know, certain genres or bands attract certain types of people from a certain subculture. There's a lot of like social science behind that, but like, you know, I think obviously you don't want to force yourself to like talk about something that you're not necessarily passionate about, or you can't naturally speak to, but you want to ask those questions like, okay, this is the kind of music I'm making. These are the similar artists. These are the kind of obvious like cultural points and conversations that people are having in this sphere. What do I think about those things? And can I speak to those things and asking those questions for yourself and, you know, not necessarily forcing something that's unnatural for you, but just asking that question of like, does this make sense for me to, to speak to this? Do I have an opinion on this that's unique? Do I have an angle on this that's unique that can inspire content and create you know conversations with people? That's really cool. So kind of dovetailing off of that a bit, like once you've done that high level sort of digging, what is a topic wheel? Something we talk about a lot at the agency and in entrepreneur mm-hmm. as a whole. How does a topic wheel uh, creation begin off of that? Or, or rather, I guess let's start with like, how would you define a topic wheel? Right. So a topic wheel is basically like if if anybody remembers an elementary school where like you would have to draw the bubble in the center of the page and then spider off these like smaller bubbles around it where you were basically learning how to like relate kind of like subtopics to a to a main topic. It's kind of like what I'm talking what I'm talking about when we say a topic wheel. So a topic wheel is just simply like three to five topics or what I like to call them like cultural crossroads or cultural crosshairs, cross points, whatever makes sense for you, but of uh, things that speak to like universal human experience that intersect with your brand. And so what a topic wheel does, it's a place to start where you can kind of start to flesh out the three-dimensional character of your artist brand and kind of figure out like what that character is and start building it. So when we talk about the music, like the music is like the heartbeat of your whole artist brand. It's the heart, it's it's the blood, it's like the life and like the, the spirit of your brand. But there are other parts to this vessel aside from just the music. There's like, you think about it, it, like a human body, like there's like arms and legs and hands and fingers and eyes and all this kind of stuff. So there's a topic wheel is like building this three-dimensional character and that's like where you would start and what it's for when it comes to actually building it obviously what we just talked about before is a place where you can start but if you want to go deeper with that there's kind of four steps that i kind of take people through and the first step is consulting your own story so you know people online more and more now we're seeing, and we've been seeing this for a long time that like the, especially in the entrepreneur circle that like these overproduced like videos, the classic music video just doesn't really perform well. And I, you know, we say that it's, it's because there's kind of a fourth wall there where the fan is an observer of the content instead of a participant in the content. Like they feel almost like they're just watching and they can't, there isn't like a, obvious human connection there. It's not immersive. Yeah, it's not immersive, right? So more and more in the online world, like we're seeing more humanized content perform better because it's something that people feel like they can actually connect with. So consulting your own story is like the first step, like really taking time to like even journal this out of like, what are some some key things about your upbringing, you know, about your musical development, you know, your, your interests, uh, formative interests, you know, past 
and current, you know, any pivotal moments in your life that revolve around relationships, hardships, concerts that you went to that you'll never forget, personal breakthroughs, or any other like passions that you have as a person, because people are looking for that connecting point. It's like when they go to your profile and they see a bunch of promo photos, like Gracie said on one Creative Juice episode, I forget which number it is, but she was like, people don't give a shit about your promo photos. <laughs> And it's true. Like, and I see this all the time is like going to an artist profile, whether on Instagram or Facebook, and they look like a product. They don't feel like a person. And people are like, cool, like you make good music, but what else? They're looking for the what else. They're looking for more. And you have to give them more if you want to talk to them more, you know? So that's the first step. And then like the second step, is kind of consulting your existing data. So if you've already been like running your marketing and you've already like been doing a social strategy, you want to kind of look at what kind of subjects and and thoughts and conversations or sentiments are already there in your existing fan base and kind of organize those and kind of figure out, okay, what are my fans already talking about and what do they already care about? And that kind of bleeds into the next step, which is like consulting fan conversations. So, you know, you want to look at your comments and your messenger conversations and your top performing posts and your ads and kind of list any recurring themes that you're seeing and use that as a place to to kind of start with like building your topic wheel and seeing what's already there. um, So you don't have to do as much work to kind of extract it from another place, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And then the fourth is just actually putting together your topic wheel. So using like your personal like story and auditing your own life on top of your existing data and your fan conversations that you've already had, you can start to extract like three to five topics and put them into your regular like content calendar And kind of create, like, I don't like to say this hard and fast, like, make a content series out of every, like, each topic. Like, you don't have to, like, be that, like, religious about it. But these are, like, just uh, starting points for you to kind of pull content inspiration from uh, and start, like, putting stuff out regularly and seeing what resonates with your audience. So you'll want to, like, do this more than one time. Like when you create a topic wheel one time, it's not going to be the only topic wheel you create because you're a person and you're evolving and your life is changing, right? So your topic wheel is going to change. So you're going to rotate stuff in and out as you learn and grow with your audience, as your your character and your artist character is developing, your audience is also going to develop. And so your topic wheel should reflect that growth as time goes on. That's really interesting. You know, something that I don't think I've ever said out loud, but hearing you kind of break down these steps and talk about then how you're going to use this content you create and how you're going to then build additional topic wheels, it kind of positions artists and bands to actually be able to use like the idea of, for example, like the social media rule of thirds, the idea that like you should be posting one third, you know, promotional content, a third networking or or interacting with others and and a third like sharing news and stuff that's adjacent to you. Whereas like most artists right now, uh, in a lot of cases get stuck in like purely promotional, like I'm going to share stuff about me and that's kind of it. That's where a lot of artists get stuck. Building out this process allows you to tap into, you know, those other three kind of legs on the stool, so to speak. Totally. Yeah. And like I was saying before, it's like be a human being. And I, I tell my founder students this all the time because this is a very common conversation that I have in my founder solo coaching sessions is if you present yourself as a product to be consumed, people are going to treat you that way. But if you present yourself as a human being, you're going to cultivate relationships and your audience is going to respond to you as a human and not just a consumer. And in all honesty, it's like when they hear your music and they like your music and then they go to your profile and all they see is promo photos and things like that. And there's nothing interesting that relates to them. It's like, cool, I like your music. Awesome. I want more of your music. But what else is there here for me? If there's nothing else there for them, 
they're going to move on to the next artist and they're, they're going to scroll past you because it's flat and there's nothing they can really connect. They're looking for that and they want to engage with that. And if you can't offer that for them, they're going to move on. Something I think is really interesting is that I don't want people to be like, oh, no, I have all these these promo press photos and then what do I do with them? I think what's really cool is what you're saying is like, it's just about having personality. You can post promo photos if you want, but then if someone comes to your page and then the captions are like, great photo backstage, it's like Shay's saying, there's no depth there. Whereas if you have like a cool caption, it's, you got to give people something to kind of chew on, you know? And I was thinking for my for myself, because we post promo photos, like, you know, photo shoot photos, but then the captions are normally like off the cuff just written in like five seconds and it's like oh well here's you know there's humor it's like here's what's going on so it's about giving people that window i think yeah and that's such a great point because that's also something that i mean i've noticed that about the 502s as well you guys post a lot of photos from your photo shoots but like you guys are so intentional with those photos (laughs) like your personality is so clear in those photos like you are being so true to your brand and You're also like, there's a lot of variety to those promo photos. It's like, sure, there's some like familiarity where there's a lot of couches and things like that. But like, (laughs) there's a lot of couches in the the 502 speed. Those are my call. You know, I just sit on them. (laughs) But the thing is, is that you're in a very common place. You know, it's a very family kind of centric space to be in. It's very inviting. And I get that sense, like, you know, where it's like, sure, they're doing a lot of these photos, but like, they're not doing the same one every time. They're not all, they're not wearing the same thing every time. It's not the same room every single time. And you bring up a great point, Ed, when it comes to copy, sure, have promo photos. Like, don't think that you can't have them and don't like stop using them. Like definitely have them. Like they're a great asset. Spread them out and get creative with your copywriting and tell a story that and and really draw that out and think about your photos like when you take promo photos like are you being intentional about location and setting is that speaking to who you are does it make sense a lot of what you're saying here is like you're giving people somewhere to go next like if everyone who digs into your music is subconsciously or consciously asking the question like what else is here for me It's kind of allowing you to construct what that what else is, what that world might look like. I'm curious, like in terms of, you know, once you kind of do this four step topic wheel process of going through and consulting your story and then looking at your data and then looking at what your fans are talking about and then working to put it all together. What is the next step of actually creating the content when it comes to like adjacent interests, for example? I think that's where a lot of artists get hung up is like, I might really love I don't know, like vintage records as an artist. And I might want to share that passion with my fans, or I might really love cooking, but connecting the dots to then say like, this is the type of content I'm going to create around that. And this is how it's going to tie back to everything else. I think that's where a lot of people get stuck. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this might be a weird answer to this question. We're full of weird here, (laughs) but it might not be what you expect me to say, but you need to know your platform. And that probably makes sense to you too, but it, it might not be something that indies initially think of right off the bat of just like, okay, now I have all these topics now, like what do I do next? Well, you need to know what platform you're making content for. And just to encourage anyone listening, if you feel pressured to be on every platform all the time, you don't have to do that. Like that's a myth. You want to focus on one or two platforms that you really like making content for and that you enjoy being on, that you use regularly. Because if, if, if you're not focusing on that platform and you're trying to be everywhere at once all the time, you're going to be spread too thin. Like It's going to feel like pulling teeth to make content. It's not going to be enjoyable for you and it's not sustainable. You know, And you can't really get very far. You can't really get any traction that way. So for example, like if you're an avid Instagram user, which I am, I am on Instagram all the time. I use it more than I use Facebook. So get to know that platform. Like what features does Instagram or Facebook or TikTok have? Like what kind of content are people gravitating towards on that platform? Like what's the style of content that works well for that platform? So you got to know your platform. And once you kind of know your platform and you understand the features or you kind of know what's available to you, start experimenting with those features. So 
to give a more concrete example, Instagram, you know, has the stories feature, the reels feature, but there's a lot that you can do like specifically with Instagram stories where you can post polls and questions and like you can use these stickers to create like almost like these low tier call to action engagement invitations for people using questions, using polls, using doing quizzes and things like that. And if you have an idea for a piece of content, that's like, Ooh, I want to take this topic and create content around this topic. Think about how you can filter that topic into things like, like what kind of questions could be asked around that content that you could like get people to respond to what kind of like quizzes or interactive pieces could you create to kind of get people talking to you? And then, you know, obviously like what works in the feed, like an Instagram, one minute videos and reels work really well. So how would you create an Instagram, a bunch of Instagram reels from this particular topic? Use your music as a backdrop. Like if you're going to do like Instagram reels, like one thing that I've seen a lot that works really, really well for artists in particular is if your song kind of has like this lyrical piece that speaks to like a universal human experience recreate that experience in the video like in the reel and then have your song as the background music you know and have the lyrics flashing on the screen i see plenty of artists that i follow do this all the time where they're using their song to create this kind of moment that speaks to a lot of people's different different experiences instead of just saying hey, here's the album art and here's a snippet of the song. So that that's kind of like what I would say is like, know the platform, know what kind of features are available to you and then take your topics and start to brainstorm some different things that you can create that fit the platform that you're going to be focusing on. But also think about like how you can get people talking. Like what features can you use to get people talking to you? Because you know, we talk about the buddy system all the time here at Entrepreneur. Like everything we do is based on the buddy system. Obviously, if you're not familiar with the buddy system, we do have a training on it, which is really awesome. But, you know, the psycho- psychological journey of, you know, someone who first discovers your music to becoming a raging fan, right? And it's the steps of the human relationship and the, the progression of that cycle. So the second stage of the buddy system is education. You know, this is where you're learning about each other. This is like the dating phase of your relationship is education, right? Yeah. So a lot of indies, I feel like they approach the education phase as a one-way street. I'm educating my fans about me and I do it the opposite, not entirely the opposite, but like, I'm like, hello, like if we're basing this off of a human relationship, you can't have a one-way street relationship. It doesn't work. That's so good. If you are wanting to build a relationship with your fans, you have to get them talking about themselves. They're going to tell you how to talk to them. But if you don't create opportunity for them to talk to you and you're talking about yourself all the time, you're never going to get that information. And your, your relationship is always going to be one-sided, which again, isn't sustainable. So think about how you can create that two-way street interaction with your content. I think you just blew up the idea of like content and, and world building in general. Like I think if I could sum up the core of what you were saying you're trying to build when you're creating a topic wheel and making this content is like, your goal is to get people talking. People in the music business might be like, well, yeah, of course it's the goal to get people talking. But what you're saying is like, it's not to get them talking about you. It's to get them talking with you and with each other. And that's how you create a world for your fans. Exactly, exactly. I just got so excited when you said that. So real world example. So I just started experimenting with this on my own Instagram page as, you know, I'm starting to kind of get back into running ads and like running fan finders and things and really trying to grow my followers on Instagram. Let's take a step back. In the fall, I ran a couple kind of mini fan finder videos, uh, not necessarily like the traditional fan finder that we train people on, but it was kind of a miniature version of it. And for a little like lower budget, just to kind of see what happened, it was using Instagram's cold boosting feature like in the app. So I I did this and I was able to grow my followers over like a couple months from like 550 to like 830 over the course of maybe two months. On just like a couple bucks a day. Yeah, literally like a couple bucks a day. And it was using like a behind the scenes kind of video. It was using one of these content like series that I extracted from a topic wheel where it was just like, 
I am going to the studio and it's just me. I'm not with a band. I'm going to record my vocal session and I am goofy as fuck in, in the vocal booth. Like I make fun of myself all the time. I like say weird shit and make weird sounds <laughs> like, and me and my producer laugh all the time and funny shit happens in the vocal booth. So like I ended up naming this little series a little later called goof in the booth because it's essentially what it is. And so I just captured these moments in the studio that are just funny and like really showcase my personality and kind of put this compilation video together using like the carousel feature and put the produced audio of the song over that. And then the first video that people see is me actually singing the song. It's like the chorus of the song, but then it like cuts to like this really goofy, like human moment in the vocal booth. So I use this piece of content used the IG boost function, grew my followers by like 350 people plus, and they were all legit people. You know what I mean? It, it was like working. And I was like, oh, these are like real people and I'm getting messages and this is really great. So when the holiday came, you know, when like Christmas and New Year's came, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to try to get these people talking. So I went in my Instagram stories and I said, hey guys, we're going to play a game. It's called Happy Crappy. And this is something my friends and I used to do where we would say like, okay, what was one happy thing about your weekend and one crappy thing about your weekend? So I asked, I was like, I want to hear one happy thing about your holiday and one crappy thing about your holiday. And I put in the next story, I put like a little like question sticker that says happy. (laughs) And then in the next one was a question sticker that said crappy. But the thing is, is I didn't just ask them that question and say, hey, talk to me. I said, I'll go first. Because a lot of the time, people are shy. They don't want to go first. They don't want to initiate. So I was like, I want to play this game with you. This is what I want to hear, but let me go first. And I told them my happy crappy and then invited them to tell me mine. And I got responses from brand new people. I had people that obviously had been following me before or friends of mine that that participated. But I had several new faces, like new followers that came from this other strategy participated in that. And then I started seeing them respond to other stories, like my stories about my cat, like Maybell uh, tends to show up a lot in my stories because she's so cute. But then people started to feel like they could talk to me. And then I started to have more conversations as time went on because that door was opened. I invited them into that space. And once I invited them into that space and kind of like was brave enough to put myself out there, they felt more confident and they felt safe to start talking because I went first. So that's an example. But doing stuff like that actually got me talking to people. And and it was crazy because we were talking about just human shit where it was just like, yeah, my holidays were this and my family this. I'm like, yeah, dude, I know what you mean about family. You know, it sucks, you know, in this regard. And then they would say, I really love your music, by the way. And it was like, okay cool. Like they love my music and they were telling me like, keep going. Like, do you have an album? Like, I can't wait for you to put out an album. And these are brand new people. And I'm just like two way street, man, two way street. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's really cool. And I also think that, you know, not that you're trying to give life lessons, but I just think this is true of a lot of things where it's like, it's actually not that hard to get people talking. You just have to actually start the conversation. Like you said, And I I think what you did was really smart because it's like a really, really easy way to start a conversation is to share a story and then ask a question at the end. Whether that's on social media or you're you're at your show talking to people and like, that's something I've had to learn is like, what do you talk to people at shows about, right? Because you, unless you have an outgoing personality, it might be kind of an awkward thing. And it's like, oh, you just tell them about a story about yourself and then, you know, you ask them a question. So I think if you're maybe more of an introvert and you're kind of like, well, I don't know how to go about, that's great. She seems like she has a great, like, kind of outgoing personality, which you do. It's like, I don't know how to replicate that. It's like, well, just share a story in a way that's comfortable and then ask at the end if anyone's had a similar experience and that opens the door. And that's a really low effort thing especially if you do it through like Instagram stories or something where it's just a static story. I think that's a really great actionable way to kind of, if you're like, oh, well, I want to, but I don't know how. Like Shay said, all right, what's your new year resolution? Put that on your story and be like, well, why don't you guys share your new year's resolutions with us or anything like that? It's it's a really easy way to get started if you want to. 
We talked about some of this idea of like being human on social media when we had Gracie on and you mentioned that Shay, I'll link to that in the show notes so, so that anybody who wants to check it out can check it out. But yeah, it's, it's really just, I think kind of circling back to what you mentioned at the top of the episode, how like generally speaking, like the, the dominant voice in the space has been like, watch what big artists are doing and, right. and emulate them. Whereas like what you really should be doing is like watch what, humans are doing on social media and interact and engage with that and that's going to be your bread and butter once you have lined up the the types of things that you want to talk about the kind of cultural crossroads that you talked about like once you've got those lined up then it's just a matter of diving into the features that people are actively taking part in kind of makes social media like fun a little bit like a maze but not like an annoying one (laughs) i think that that's really cool and, and such a great point. And, and I know like you get to do this not only for your own music, but also for a lot of artists at the agency. I'm specifically thinking about one of the bands that's on board at Indie X right now. When, when we were getting ready to onboard them, I was having a conversation and they were like, yeah, like I'm really looking forward to building a world inside of our email marketing and that people feel like they're immersed in like Lord of the Rings or something. And yeah. immediately I was like, well, for one, like, yeah, that's what we love to do. And two, like Shay is the perfect person to like strategize on this account. Really, really cool. I'm curious. And, and maybe this would just be like a fun little exercise. Like I'm going to just role play for a second here and say to you, like, if I'm coming to you for like a, a consultation, like one-on-one, we're going to talk about like how I can up my content strategy right now all i've been doing is you know posting an errant cover here and there and that's pretty much it and then promoting my songs when they drop i'm a conscious hip-hop artist that likes i'm gonna pull from things that i actually like i'm not a i'm not a hip-hop artist at all but i'm a let's say i'm a conscious hip-hop artist that likes cooking uh watches star wars regularly week to week when new episodes drop on disney plus and uh i come from a religious background and you know, okay, there's there's four starting points for you. What okay. what would you ask me next? So immediately when I when you said I have an interest in cooking, so it would be really cool if you made like some video clips of like you cooking and you what's it called freestyle rapping about what you're cooking, like with the ingredients and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And like, do stuff like that. That would be really sick. And you could do that as like reels or like, you know, you could do that as short little clips or even like getting one of your other like hip hop friends together and like making a meal together and doing some sort of like freestyle battle in the kitchen. Yeah, that's dope. That would probably go viral if anybody's listening and wants to do that, especially the Star Wars thing. Can you imagine if you're doing what Shay just said and then like you're freestyling over like the Star Wars theme song, making like Darth Vader waffles. I don't know what you do with in the kitchen, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then like, if you're like super into Star Wars, you could, oh, it would be kind of cool. You could do this contest where like, if you're super into Star Wars and you could, if, if your fans, like if you, this, you would have to know like how much your fans are into Star Wars in order to do right. this. But that goes back to like consulting your data and like looking right. at fan conversations. Right. But if like you and your fans, like, you know, really love Star Wars, and whatnot you could have like your fans submit like one of their favorite star wars quotes you know people could maybe like vote on you know their favorite star wars quote or something like that and you could take that star wars quote and like write a song from that star wars quote or freestyle rap from that star wars quote or maybe freestyle rap over that scene in star wars or do something of that nature but taking those famous quotes from like Yoda and things like that and like making something from that that speaks to your artistry that would be really neat let's see what else did you say I'm just blown away with the ideas right now Jack's gonna make some rap videos I wish that I was a conscious rapper that loved cooking Star Wars and came from a religious background (laughs) that doesn't quite doesn't quite fit the profile I do like I do like cooking though and I do love Star Wars Another idea, like you could dress up as different Star Wars characters and do a rap battle with yourself as these different characters. Oh yeah, that could be cool. And like try to like rap in like the voice of that character. Like that'd be so fucking funny. Cosplay style. Yeah. All right, Ed, it's your turn in the topic wheel exercise here. We've never done this on Creative Juice before. This is fun. (laughs) Love it. Oh, am I, am I giving, oh, I'm shooting the example. I thought I was about to be girled. No, you're going to be here and put me on the spot, bro. I thought I was like, oh boy, what's going to come my way? Okay, what do we do? Cooking, Star Wars, and something else? All right, you 
love westerns, but you live in the middle of New York City and uh, you're a folk singer with a flair for neon things. Neon cowboy. That's your series right there is neon cowboy. Looking around my apartment picking. I have all those things in my apartment minus New York City. Okay. So you love Westerns. You're a folk singer, but you live in New York City and you love neon. So, so immediately I think about like, okay, you live in New York City, but you love Westerns. So maybe there, I don't know this for sure, but maybe there's this element of like longing for like a simpler life. So you could make some content around that. But immediately what I pictured when you said Western in New York City, creating some sort of like dressing up at like, as like a fucking cowboy or a fucking like Western character from one of your favorite Western shows or something to that effect, right? And walking down like a New York alleyway, playing a song with neon lights around your boots or some shit like that and call it the neon cowboy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like... <laughs> like that those are two very like polarizing things but like but it but that in itself is a pattern interrupt like no one would fucking expect to see that you know like playing a banjo in a cowboy outfit with neon lights on your boots walking through new york city and like having a bunch of like people come around you watching you do this like in the middle of new york city like or like new york city rodeo you know what I mean? Like you create some content yeah. around like what would a rodeo look like in New York City, you know? Um, and if you're a folk artist, you could gather a bunch of other folk artists in New York City and create content around like a musical rodeo. Like what would a musical rodeo look like? Anyway, those yeah. are thoughts that come to mind. Like I'm literally spitballing, pulling shit out of my ass. So. Those are great ideas though. And like the thing I take away is like, if you're trying to think of like, oh, what can I do? It's like, oh, just literally the first thing that comes to mind in the biggest possible way and then there's logistical challenges, you know? But it's like all those ideas, you just you just spit out like seven of them. It's like, oh, these are all great. All right, well now let me figure out what I can actually do. You know what's funny about all of this is like, we're, we're laughing about these ideas because we kind of like went to extremes as much as we could. <laughs> but it doesn't have to put, you know, if you're a very serious artist, it doesn't have to put you in a place where you're doing like comedy. You know, I, I think a lot of artists, especially when it comes to like Instagram reels or TikTok, they're like, I don't right. want to, I don't want to dance and stuff like that, but you don't have to. And that's not really what we're right. getting. That's not really the point of what we're getting at here. It's just looking to identify the things that you are into that are adjacent to, or even unrelated to your music so that you've got more than just that thing to talk about to your fans. You know, it's more than just putting that out there. It, it really is like building a three-dimensional character for you or allowing fans yeah. to, to see the three-dimensional person that you already are. To spin off of that, Shay has the same flair for the dramatic that I do, where it's like, we're going as big as possible. But if you're listening and you were the person in, in my scenario, it's like, you could just write a song, you know, a singer songwriter song about how, you know, it's like modern day Western, something like that. Where it's like you and your guitar, and it's just kind of a heartfelt song about how, like you said, oh, well, you know, you miss the Western whatever, but now you're in New York. Anyways, you don't have to be all over the top. It's like you can take your interests and bake them in however you want to and however it feels natural, like Jack's saying. I literally just thought of another thing for the Western. So if you're <laughs> in this scenario, if like you're a folk artist and you're in New York City, like New York City is a fucking crazy place. Like it is like a wild, wild west all in its own. Building this kind of like world of living the wild, wild west through the lens of New York City, writing folk songs that speak to like New York culture. If you're a folk artist, like folk songs are very narrative focused. Like, I think of Dolly Parton and the song Code of Many Colors. She's literally telling a story. Like that's all that folk songs are, is they're just so story centric and very like uh, narrative. Taking that style and applying it to like New York culture and New York culture is like the opposite. It's like very fast paced, right? But like taking your experiences of living in New York City and making folk songs from those experiences about New York City life or, you know, something like that. Shooting videos where it's like you're in the wild, wild west, you know, of New York City and you're having to wrangle a bunch of crazy people outside your apartment. Like, I don't know. Like the key is here is like looking at something else through the lens of something else. That's like literally the rule of a metaphor is you are looking 
at something through the lens of something else. And it's like, do that with your content. You do it in songs all the time. Do it with your content. I think that that's a great point. And it kind of underlines something we talk about often on the show is like, let your marketing be an extension of your creativity, not, you know, an afterthought. I want to wrap up with one quick little note. Ed mentioned that like you guys are both aficionados for the eclectic and something that you're doing that I just wanted to highlight and like, you could chat about if you want is you're building a video game right now for your album launch or your future EP launch, which is crazy. It's like, talk about like going to the extreme. I'd love to hear, I'm sure our listeners would love to hear too, like just a little bit about what you're doing there, just from, you know, from like a high level narrative standpoint, not so much from like the technical, but just like how this fits in. Yeah. So to give a little bit of context before I share more about that, as a kid, I was always trying to replicate the worlds that I felt connected to. So if there was a movie or a video game that I fell in love with as a child, I would literally try to recreate that world using cardboard and construction paper, (laughs) like building my own spaceship out of cardboard building my own private investigator costume from construction paper and like creating like these scenes from these movies that I found myself in or these video games that I found myself in and literally trying to physically recreate them and building my own story in that world or trying to like take a piece of that narrative from the original story and start there and then have my own adventure. My friends and I were playing Crocodile Hunter all the time when we would go camping and I'd bring stuffed animals and we'd like wrestle stuffed animals on the cabin floor and get rope and pretend we were like catching a croc. Like we did shit like this all the time. Very hyperactive imagination. (laughs) So, so in my adolescence, I started to get more interested in game development because I wanted to like build virtual worlds But I kind of have always had this interest in the background and kind of like went all in on music and kind of left that behind. But I've had this thought in the back of my head for like several years now, whenever I found out about the ultimate album launch strategy here at Entrepreneur, and this is before I was an employee here, I thought, man, an ultimate album launch, if the goal is to build an experience and if the goal is to like bring people into a world, like what better way to do that than like a game? People play games on their phones all the time. And, you know, online gaming and things like that have has, has just skyrocketed. Like the gaming industry is massive and it's come a long way. And I thought, man, what if I could build a game around my music somehow and like use that as the album launch experience? And so taking what I've done already as a child and like make it actually happen. So to give you like an example or to just give you like an outline of what this actually is for me without getting too technical, using an open source game development software called Unreal Engine, I decided to create a small level where you can collect specific items and each of these items in the game are hyperlinked to a web page that has like a piece of content that's related to the song that is special so as you're like going through the level collecting these items you're essentially piecing together the song as you move through so like lyrics and like live videos production breakdowns and you know stories behind the song things like that so taking our album launch the content that you would typically see in an album launch and connecting it to like this objective in the game so they're experiencing the song itself in this level by collecting these items and then once they collect all these items it unlocks a rare item that is connected to some sort of offer like merch offer that they find embedded in the game. The reason I chose Unreal Engine to do this was because a lot of other platforms don't allow you to like use hyperlinks or like URLs and attach them to assets in the game. But with Unreal Engine you can do this. And so when it comes to the EP launch, you know, I haven't quite figured out exactly how I'm going to like roll this out yet, but each level of the world is related to a song and 
as you're going through each level, you're kind of like experiencing the whole collection. So if it was an EP, like you'd have like five levels that you'd have to play through and they're not complicated. It's not like they're Zelda Ocarina of Time and you have to solve all these puzzles. It's fairly easy to find the things because the focus is not necessarily the gameplay itself. The focus is the content. And they don't want people missing out on that content because, you know, there's some sort of objective that's too hard for them to figure out. But that's essentially like what I'm working on. And I'm not sure exactly how it's going to roll out in the long run, if I'm going to drop all five levels at once, or if I'm going to roll, you know, each level out with each song over time. I'm not exactly sure yet, but the whole story like behind the game itself so far is my songs are a lot about like self-discovery and like deconstruction and like figuring out who you are versus who everyone expected you to be. And so like there's this element of self-discovery in the game where it's like the main character is searching for this other character that goes missing and they left their journal pages scattered all over the world. And as we're collecting those journal pages, we're discovering what happened to them and where they are and how to find them. And each of those journal pages are connected to an element of the song of all these songs that have to do with self-discovery and exploration. So it kind of all connects together thematically as well. I feel like if that doesn't exemplify, along with everything else that we talked about on this episode, why I refer to you as like the wizard of world building, (laughs) this kind of puts the nail in the coffin. I think that that's such a cool project. We've been fortunate enough to be able to see some of the leaks of what the game looks like, but I'm so excited to see it roll out. And thanks for coming on, Shay, and and sharing all of this with us. It's definitely... I think for any artist that's looking to get into creating cool content, especially as we you know, roll into a new year here, these are all such good things to be thinking about and a good way to position yourself as a well-rounded artist and not just one dimensional. So thank you so much for sharing so much amazing insight. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I love Creative Juice and I'm so happy to be back and I can't wait for next time. Hell yeah, we'll have to do a, another episode together once we launch the EP and the game. If any of you guys are interested in building your team in the new year and you're looking to bring on marketing help, looking to build up your team and you're interested in working with someone like Shay, we'll leave an app link for IndieX in the show notes. We are opening up a few more slots at IndieX as we roll into 2022 here. So if you're interested and you're looking to build a team, shoot us some notes and we'll see if it might be a good fit. And uh, that is an awesome wrap, I think, to this episode talking about world building. Thank you so much, Shay, for kicking it with us. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys next week on Creative Juice. Thanks for hanging out, Indies. Peace out. Peace out.